So who inspired you? I mean, how did you come to be a speaker? I mean, I mean did you just did you just get overwhelmed with, with requests and you thought, well, that's more fun. Let me do that. It all started, I finished at Disney as Head of Innovation and Creativity. It didn't start that way. I actually started as the cappuccino boy in the London office uh, some 30 years prior to that. And about three weeks into the role, I was told, you're going to be the character coordinator at tonight's royal premiere of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, who presents a Princess Diana. I was like, oh, what do I do? They said, will you stand at the bottom of the stairs and make sure that nothing untoward happens? I thought, well, I can't possibly screw that up. What's the I thought? <laughs> Well, that's the day when I found out what a contingency plan was because I didn't have one. Well, a contingency plan would tell you if you're going to bring a rabbit with very long feet down a staircase towards the Princess of Wales, you might want to measure the width of the steps first. I didn't. Roger trips on the first step and is now hurtling head over feet like a bullet down the stairs towards Diana, whereupon he was met in midair by two royal protection officers who didn't hesitate. They just took him out. And there's a very famous <laughs> of Reuters of Roger going backwards through the air like this with two Secret Service heavies coming at him like this and a little 21-year-old guy from Disney in the background going, ah, shit, I'm fired. So um, didn't go to work the next day. I thought, well, this is no point. Got a call from Los Angeles. I thought, are oh, they going to tell me I'm fired? And all I heard was, that was great publicity. It's like, who knew I could make a career out of this? <laughs> and so for, so for the next 20 years, I got to have some of the more mad, audacious, uh, outrageous ideas for Pixar, Lucasfilms, Marvel, etc. I uh, came up with storylines and characters for Toy Story, Monsters Incorporated, Cars. Um, and then I was with Disney for 30 years and I got the bronze Jiminy Cricket, thank you for 30 magical years of service statue. And I kind of looked at it and a bit of mortality there. Uh, but there's also, there's this gap in the market which seems to have accentuated in a post-pandemic world between the C-suite. We're all sitting there saying, you must innovate, you must take risks, you must be brave, we must think differently. And all of their employees going, great, how? And nobody's mm -hmm. showing people how. And so... Um, I basically, what I do is I give, all I wanted to do is boil it down and embed a culture of innovation into everybody's DNA by making innovation easier for people, less intimidating and ethereal, creativity tangible for people who hate ambiguity and gray, and the process fun. Why is it fun? Because people enjoy using it when the boss isn't around. That's why it's fun. It's a design thinking model, but why shouldn't it work be fun? Okay. Cool. And, and since leaving Disney and embarking, I think you must be quite easily one of the busiest speakers in America right now. Are you having fun? I am. We, uh, on March 15th, 2020, I flew into Copenhagen from New York uh, to be received and told that the Danish Prime Minister had just banned live events, obviously because of COVID. So I spoke to 3,000 empty chairs and a camera. That was a little weird. Came back right. to the US and thought, right, I'm unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> so I hired a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old out of the UK. I said, take me virtual. We did 223 virtual events last year. I can speak in 37 different languages through an artificial intelligence robot. It's a language of your choice simultaneously. We do about 15% of our work in virtual reality. I did a workshop a couple of weeks ago with a lady from Johannesburg who reached right out to me with a virtual pen in her virtual hand. I took it out of her virtual hand in my virtual hand, none of which existed, wrote on a virtual post-it note, virtual ink, and handed it back the post-it note. Um, <laughs> and so for this year, of course, live has exploded. I would, I would think, I think at the moment we're on track to hit over 200 live events this year, which means, uh, you, as somebody once told me, they, uh, they don't pay you to speak, they pay you to fly. <laughs> exactly. And so you fly, you sleep, you speak, you fly. But I love it. I love getting in a room with a group of people who, who've, just don't think they can innovate. They've been told they're not creative so many times. And it's about, it's not about me telling them they're creative. It's about me giving them some exercises to do where they prove to themselves they're actually far more creative than they think they are. Um, it's about helping all of us. The biggest barrier to innovation is ourselves and our own, I call it our river of thinking. Uh, it's our expertise and our experience. And that river is very fast, very wide and very deep and allows you and me to make quick and informed decisions. But we're being asked to get out of that river more and more often now because of the level of disruption that's coming. And so my goal is to equip people with a set of tools to stop them thinking like that and give them permission to think like this. That's awesome. So speaking of that, and of course, COVID decimating our industry worldwide, um, how fantastic that you you found a 17 and a 19 year old to help you get through all of that. That's, you know, I have a 15 year old, so she needs to step up her I game. Have, yeah. oh, so do you remember the old Charlie Brown cartoons when Charlie Brown used to walk into the principal's office and all you ever heard was this look? 
wah, 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 wah. No, 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 no. Don't be boring, motto number one. So it's about engaging people and creating a fully immersive environment. So I built a studio uh, in my house. So this is kind of what I see when I'm going live. Uh, and mm -hmm. then I actually work the room. I do not stay on a webcam. I'm actually working the room with a videographer. We're going all the way around. We're doing exercises with the audience as we go. And then we can push them again. I made a big investment. Um, we created a whole set of virtual tools and virtual breakout rooms. Nobody has to worry about the, the tech. We do that. That's on us. They, work, they focus on the content. Um, but it is about making it immersive and engagement and participatory. People learn by doing. They do not learn by listening. And so even when I'm on a stage, actually, I'm never on the stage because I'm out in the audience. Um, I'm giving people exercises to do because that's where they really take the big learnings away. What has been, speaking about being out in the audience, wh which has been your best talk? Uh, obviously, don't, you don't well, have so, to do that. Most enjoyable was uh, this weekend. I did 4,000 lunch ladies. It was so fun because these people are the heartbeat of America. They're the people who feed our kids each and every day. And they're probably, I said to this one woman, it was super early in the morning, we did rehearsals. I said, why are you smiling at this time in the morning? She goes, because that could be the only smile that student gets today. I was like, wow. wow. You know what? How humbling is that, right? And so uh, I think it's the ones that I, when I get these beautiful notes back from people six weeks later or six months later saying, you changed my life. You allowed me to step out of what I'm doing and live my dreams. And I am more creative than I thought I was. Thank you for helping me prove it to myself. It's the notes that you get that I think are the most rewarding. Okay. Okay. And, and so the... And then I have to ask you, because you've been to every airport in the world by now, I'm sure, which is your favorite airport and which is your worst? <laughs> worst Newark. Don't go there. And any <laughs> circumstance, I don't care if you've got an event in New Jersey, I will fly in from Canada and drive if I had to. I will not <laughs> fly to Newark Airport. It is a total and utter disaster area. Um, isn't it funny? We always remember the bad ones, not the good ones. <laughs> um, the good one, yeah, look, uneventful. If somebody says, how was your flight? And I can say uneventful, then that was a good flight. <laughs> cool. And how does your family manage you being away so much? I mean, that must be hard for them. Well, yeah, it was until I was back for two years. And then my wife's like, could you please get out of the house? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's so funny. <laughs> Not many uh, speakers tell me that when I ask them that. So coming from, coming from Disney and this amazing magical world, I have to ask you, do you watch TV? And if you do, do you watch Disney Plus? It, what, what do you do? What do you do in your yeah, downtime? Uh, yeah, um, listen, I'm still consulting a lot with the various entities. So I've still helped out on some of the more Lucasfilms recent properties for Disney Plus, uh, The Mandalorian. So, so yeah, I get a lot. Of, it's about, here's the thing. If I were to ask you, if you've ever driven home on your commute and you get back to your house and you look at your front door and there's just that split second where you just think, how did I get here? Um, right, it's happened to all of us. Well, what happened on the way home? Well, because you go past the same stimulus day in, day out, day in, day out on our commute, our brain physically shut down and it didn't wake up till we got home. The motto of this is no fresh stimulus in, no new ideas out. So I'm constantly searching for fresh stimulus. Listen to different radio stations, listen to different podcasts, go on a different commute. Uh, I carve out proactively one hour a day. It's called Time to Think. Um, and I spend a lot of time on websites, obviously, looking for stimulus. Yes, I love to watch a lot of film and television. Again, just and normally I'll click on something that I think I might not enjoy, but it's or might not be my genre per se. Uh, but it's just about getting fresh stimulus in. Okay. And music wise, what's a favorite, favorite band, favorite genre of music, given the choice? ABBA, and I'm not ashamed to say it. Oh, my hero. My <laughs> Not for loving ABBA, but for not being ashamed to say it, because I think everybody <laughs> on earth is probably an ABBA fan, but most of us are not not uh, not happy to admit it. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, having worked with these truly inspiring people for thirty years, who who their whole world is making magic and making the world's happiest places, who inspired you to? carry on being, I mean, it must have been a hell of a, 
ask every day to continue to be more creative, more mm -hmm. inspiring, more yeah. magical. I mean, that's a lot of pressure to put under a human being. Who, who or what inspired you to do that every day? There is one God but mentor, Sir Richard Branson. I oh. love Sir I love Richard. I've worked with him on several occasions. If you look at the number of products that Richard has created over the years that don't exist anymore, they far outnumber the amount of products that do exist. Why? Uh, because he took a risk and he failed. Fail. First act in learning. And he learned from it and applied it to something else. I, uh, two things that he does, uh, he's not afraid to take risks. Uh, if I were to ask you, do you consider him a successful person or an unsuccessful person? I think most people would say the word successful. Um, equally, he is one of the very few, and I mean less than 1% of CEOs who actually understand that it is, in fact, employees first, not customers. Mm -hmm. Now, that depends on the industry in which you work, clearly. But if your employees are touching your guests and your consumers eight hours a day, then really they're the ones that will make sure that it's a great experience. And I think in certain industries... They still don't get it. They still <laughs> and it's like, no, your employees are touching your customers for eight hours a day. So I think Richard, because he takes, he inspires risk. And there's a fabulous quote. You see it all the time. Is If somebody says, can you do something? You say yes, and then go figure it out. Sure. And I've spent my entire career doing that. And of your entire career, what would you say is your highlight? Sending my son's Buzz Lightyear into space on a NASA, up to space for NASA. It was the opening of Toy Story. And as you know, um, Buzz Lightyear's dream was to fly, but he couldn't because he was a toy. I said, well, what if we can make Buzz Lightyear's dream come true? And people said, how are you going to do that? I said, I'm going to send him into space. Of course, I hadn't asked NASA at that time. So I met with NASA. You could tell that I, uh, I was up in their headquarters in Washington, D.C., and you could tell that half the room just loved the idea of taking Buzz Lightyear up into space, and half the room didn't even want to open the window before they shoved me through it. And so um, they agreed to take Buzz into space, and we got a call from Johnson Space Center six months before launch, and they said, hey, we need two Buzz Light years here tomorrow. I was like, tomorrow? The launch is six months from now. He goes, yeah, well, we need to dim, uh, we're going to um, dismantle one molecule by molecule. I was like, because? And he said, well, if we find um, an air pocket inside the plastic of the toy, the size of an atom, that could uh, explode in the vacuum of space and potentially injure or kill an atom. I was like, oh. Okay, so at the time, we, but here's the thing, we didn't have any Buzz Lightyear's for sale, they'd all gone. So I had 37 cast members in Kmart, Walmart, Target, trying to find Buzz Lightyear. And so, so we found one, I thought, don't tell me this deal is going down because the Walt Disney Company can't find Buzz Lightyear. So I got a call, this is in the days before smartphones, uh, when we had the old Motorola Flips, the coolest phone on the planet, you know, bomb, <laughs> gee. And so, uh, and so all I heard was, to infinity and beyond. I was like, who is this? And she, it was my, she said, oh, it was my wife. I said, well, where'd you find him? She goes, oh, he's been underneath James's bed collecting dust. I said, oh, get over. So uh, I wrote James on his foot, just as Andy had written his name on Woody's foot. And I sent two buses off to NASA. I said, don't destroy this bus light year. This is a real little boy's bus light year. So six months later, we went down to the launch. I got quite emotional. I was like, I'm sending my little boy into space. <laughs> um, and so Buzz went up to space. He is, in fact, the longest serving astronaut uh, consecutive in space. He spent 18 months on the International Space Station. When he came down to land, uh, the weather was poor. So it landed in Edwards Air Force Base in California. I don't know if you remember those wonderful images of the 747 carrying the space shuttle back across the country. Well, I have the passenger manifest, the actual passenger manifest produced by NASA. Seat 1A, Congressman, blah, blah, blah. Seat 24C, uh, Commander, blah, blah, blah. Seat 42B, Commander, Buzz Lightyear was like, uh, Buzz is coming home. And so I now can go to, if you go to the Space Museum, the Air and Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., you will find Buzz Lightyear with a little bronze plaque underneath him saying, Gift of James Wardle, aged eight. Oh, that's amazing. That's, a, that's a, wow. Okay, I got goosebumps for that. I can imagine. What did your son think about that? Was he upset oh. that you gave his toy away? Um, no, he'd kind of, you know, been under his bed collecting dust for about four or five years. I think he, now that he's, you know, he's 24 now, right? So uh, I think he's, he hasn't had a chance to get up and see it. You know, thank you for reminding me. I'm going to take a weekend to go out and see Buzz with my son. Yes, very cool. I'd love to know what he, what he, I mean, he must, yeah, let me, let me know. Let me know what he, what he thinks, what his reaction is. <laughs> 24 year old men, you know, then like, I'm not going to show much emotion. So let's see if he no. does. <laughs> okay. Um. So we know about Richard Branson. We know that he inspired you. Um, was there was there a, um, a favorite a favorite character of yours from Disney or somewhere um, else? Is there somebody that you would like to have made into a Disney character? Well, so well, no, because here's the thing. 
when we were, there was a lunch, we were all kicking around ideas. And I'm a 60s kid, right? I grew up in black and white. <laughs> um, and cowboys were gods. Cowboys were gods. They roamed the range. There was Davy Crockett. There was the Lone Ranger. And we all had the sheriff's badge and the plastic pistols. And we kind of used to walk around like this. And then uh, one day, one day, um, some dude called Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and ruined it for all of us cowboys. And the next day, we were all wanting to be astronauts. Well, where do you think the insight for Toy Story came from? That's yeah. exactly what the insight from Toy Story came from. And so uh, I have a real affinity for Buzz. Um, I just, yeah, I just, yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. So um, I have to ask this because it's on my list here. Apart from being this super creative genius, this world traveling, extremely busy, uh, global speaker, do you have any hidden talents that we don't know about? Uh, people often ask if I draw my own stuff, the answer is yes. Um, so every presentation is hand drawn and customized. So uh, let's see if I've got a picture of the hand. Let's see. No, that's not it. This one was for Toyota. So it was all cars, obviously. I don't know if you can see it or not. Yes, we can. That one was the Toyota. Uh, and then this one somewhere back here. This one, I did, <laughs> I did one for Kate Williams' team at Royal Sandringham, so that was kind of fun. <laughs> wow. So, okay. yeah, I, uh, I like to draw. I like to paint. Um, yeah, so, yeah. On Sunday, thing, although it's not really a British thing, is it, really? We kind of just burn and feel, but that's okay. <laughs> That's very cool. So that's the, that I have to say, uh, Eva is probably my my favorite Wally. I think is one of my favorite movies of Disney. Um, oh, well, I just, well, I think Wally, it's very we loved it. We loved it. It was re really cool. It, it's a very prof, uh, prophetic film, and I think it's you know the fact that the human race still doesn't get it just stuns me into oblivion. I mean, it's been mm -hmm. laid out before us. I think one of the things Pixar does better than anybody else is empathy. And what yes. they do is, I mean, here we have a mute robot. Wally can't speak, and he's made yep. out of rust. And within yep. the first five minutes of the film, we feel empathy for Wally. But why do we feel empathy for a mute robot that cannot speak? Because in the opening sequence, you see him go into his little cave of wonders, and he's watching Hello, Dolly on the television, and he sees two of the film stars hold hands. Okay. And instantly in his eyes, we see that Wally desires to be loved. Well, we all desire to be loved. And that's how Pixar is really good at creating empathy around their stories. Mm. Mm. And as, as you say, prophetic. And I still, even though my daughter is going to be 15 next month, I still use bits of Wally to sort of, you know, tease her because her generation are all on their phones all the time. And I'm like, you know that scene in Wally where they couldn't walk because they were so busy with their phones and they become so fat and they couldn't walk that they had to have those things that carried them? Like, you know, can you see where that's going? Yeah. She gets mad but, with me. <laughs> but don't, don't be scared. A lot of people ask me, do I think video games are killing creativity? The answer is no. They're inspiring creative. Video games are creative problem solving 101. Your children are choosing their own challenge, their own avatar, their own uh, instruments, their own path. And so, no, I believe that uh, gaming is going to take over a lot of industries. There's no question about that, including education. Mm. I agree. Um, so it's not the gaming that I, that I, I have a challenge with. It's the... It's, um, dare I say, a TikTok. Um, I don't think that there's a whole heck of a bunch of, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but there's, we could spend our time better. And I am on TikTok and I do spend time and I love it and it's funny, but I don't, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Well, I what do you think? That, uh, well, I, here's the thing. In the next decade, uh, artificial intelligence is estimated to take away anywhere between 20 and 30% of our current jobs that we do today. So how will you and I compete with that, with robots that can think thousands of times faster than us? Well, um, ask the artificial intelligence experts that are designing AI, uh, what do they believe will be the most employable skill sets of the next decade? And they will tell you, oh, uh, that's easy, the ones that will be hardest to program. And then ask them, well, what are those? And they'll tell you, oh, the ones with which you were born. We were all born creative. We didn't play with the toy, we played with the box. We were all born. We, we, and then, but then we went to school and education. We were told to color in between the lines on our first day in class. We were all born curious. We used to ask why, 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 why? And then we went to school and we were told to stop asking why because there's only one right answer. We have an amazing intuition. We have 120 billion neurons in our first brain, 120 million neurons in our second brain. Um, and we all have an amazing imagination. 
you know, we dream that England will regain the Ashes one day or win a football game on penalties, but we all know that's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, I believe that whilst these skill sets were almost certainly not the most employable skill sets of the last two decades and perhaps didn't need to be, they are the most employable skill sets in the next decade because they are the ones that will be the hardest to program. They are an innate with all, all of us. But here's the challenge. And I did an experiment at Yale University before Christmas. I brought, I had, was speaking to 3,000 university students, all between the ages of 18 and 24. So I brought in one first grade class, one 30, a group of 36 year olds. I sat them right in the middle with their teacher. I said, hands up, who's creative? Me, 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 30 people, bam, didn't hesitate. The rest of the audience, I'm not creative. Education is killing creativity. Mm. Education is killing curiosity. Education is killing imagination and intuition. Um, and the Western form of education is suffering significantly. Why do I believe India will surpass most countries as a superpower in the next 30 years? Not because their population surpasses China this year, which it does. Not because the percentage of kids underneath 25 far outstrips China. Not because a much greater percentage of India speaks English and China doesn't. It's got nothing to do with that. A much greater percentage of their kids can't afford education. Uh, they are bringing 1.4 billion entrepreneurs and you watch them march past the rest of planet Earth because they are wow. creative people solving each and every day. I, I believe the most creative people are the people with the smallest amount of budgets. Is that, I mean, we were tasked to go and create light where there was no electricity in a slum in Mumbai on a zero budget pro bono. They paid our travel. I was sitting in a, uh, in a uh, and again, this goes back to being curious and playful, right? Sitting in a cafe one day and I noticed that the spotlight hit the plastic bottle I was drinking out of and I noticed it created a little, every time I lifted it off the table, there was a ring of light or a circle of light. I thought, that's interesting. So then I took the advertising label off the side of the plastic and I could get it out a bit wider. Then I took the lid off the bottle, wider. Then I played with the water level in the bottle. I could get it out to about, by the time I start, raised it up to about waist height, I could get it out about to two or three feet by the time the circle of light hit the floor. I thought, well, hang on a minute, just stand up. So I stood up on a chair and obviously the closer the bottle to the light source, I could get it up to about six or eight feet by the time it hit the floor. Walked out to a hut next door in the slum with no light in it whatsoever, cut a hole in the ceiling, stuffed the bottle through it and lit the hut during daylight hours. Wrote to a friend of mine who works for Evian in Paris who used to work at Disney. I'm a great believer in you pick up the phone and you make your pitch. They can say yes, they can say no, they can laugh, they can put the phone down. Uh, I said, hey, Send me a million empty plastic bottles. You're about to trash the planet with them anyway. And send them to me for free. I can't afford the shipping. And by the way, take your logo off because these people need the light. And uh, six weeks later, we lit a million huts uh, wow. during day was uh, on zero budget and no electricity. That's incredible. That's what so for people who say, I don't have the resources, I think that's a cop out. Hmm. Well, my last question to you, because I know that we're running out of time, is uh, you've said that we're going to lose 30 percent of our of our jobs as we are in the next decade. Where do you think the speaking industry is going? Do you think we'll always have work? It's going virtual. So here's why it's going virtual. The metaverse is coming. Technology and AR. If you want it to snow inside a conference center three years from now with the glasses that you're wearing on now, you'll be able to make that happen. The technology is going to force it this way. Carbon emissions. It will no longer be socially acceptable to fly 500 or 5,000 people to another city to host a conference five years from today because Generation Z, quite rightly, Wally, will say, I'm not coming. And then you've got what people are refusing to look at. 2005 to 2020, 20, Ebola, bird flu, H1N1, SARS, and COVID. Will we have another one three years from today? Yes, we will. Will it be global or regional? I don't know. Will it send us even more virtual than we already were? Yeah, the industry's moving virtual. As I mentioned, I did that workshop in Spatial with this lady where she walked right up to me from South Africa and handed me a virtual pen, and we worked together, and we were in the same room together. So I think that's where it's headed. Not overnight. Um, I think this year and next year, live is back with a vengeance because we all want to get our teams back together. Then I think the CFO is going to say, hey, hang on, how much was that event last year versus the year before? Hmm, you know what, we're going virtual next year. Then I think we'll see hybrids and as technology pandemics and virtual increase, then I think you'll see a shift into virtual. But I also think the conference industry needs to be blown up. I think it hasn't changed since 1962. It's uh, networking from 8.30 till 9 o'clock with burnt coffee, sour orange juice and a croissant that's two days old and a bit stodgy. Uh, then the sponsors on the stage boring the living crap out of everybody for 15 minutes. Keynote speakers now running late. Promise is time for Q&A, but oh, we ran out of time. We go to a break. We come back to the panel of doom. How do I know it's the panel of doom? It's four executives on four armchairs, not engaging or embracing or immersing anybody in the audience, just talking amongst themselves. And how do you know? Stand at the back of the room. 
50%, and that's the least amount of people are looking at their phone wondering what's for lunch or doing my email. That's how you know it's the panel of doom. We go to lunch each yesterday, steak, shrimp, and chicken, leftover from convention services. Come back to your breakout group, always the best part of the day, but oh, we never had enough time. We finish with a rah-rah speaker with beautiful teeth. It bounces up and down a lot and says, life is great, you're great. We leave inspired and motivated and pumped and ready to change the world. And a week later, somebody walks up to you and says, hey, how was that conference in Chicago? Oh, yeah, it was great. And you walk away and you think, God, I can't remember a damn thing. And so I think the days of purely motivating and inspiring people, I think that's a cop out. I don't, people have given you the biggest gift of their life. They have given you a day of their time. Give them back something in return. Yes, I want to be inspired and motivated, but I need some tools to stop me thinking the way I do today and to help me think differently, whether I've got a budget of $5 million or $5. And that's what I hope I bring. Okay, I think that's uh, that's the perfect place to end that. I think that was the thank you for your time. You've given us a great gift. I know how busy that you are with that, and I appreciate it. I love the way that you think. Obviously, I'm a Disney fan. Um, I, t I like to think of myself as a creative. If, you had, if I had to show you what my desk looks like, I think you know most people around me would think that I'm a creative. So I value, value your time. I appreciate it. And I hope that we can get you into more rooms across the world. No, thank you. I, I define creativity as the ability to have an idea, and everybody can do that. I define innovation as the ability to get it done. Fantastic. Duncan Wardle, thank you so much. I sincerely appreciate it. And cool. we, I hope to see you uh, not in Johannesburg, which is my hometown, by the way, but <laughs> uh, in person sometime soon. All right. Nice to meet you. Thank you ever so thank much. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.